Welcome to the Farmers Forum Saturday session. I'm Patrick Byers, horticulture specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. And our next presenter is Dan Kenny on the topic of growing a future, preparing tomorrow's sustainable growers today. So let's welcome Dan. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I want to thank um, Sarah, and I also would like to thank uh, Small Farm Magazine for having this event today and had given me an opportunity to come all the way from Northern Illinois to share with you about what we're doing up there. Today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the history of our project and then where we are now and where we hope to go. We're very early in our project and so uh, the SARE um, grant that we were given, we're in the process of using right now and I'll go into more detail about that. One of the things I wanted to ask was how many of you are actually farmers in the crowd? Up of you. Well, I wanted to bring up uh, something I thought about this morning is that we have something in common, possibly, is that we're both nonprofits. <laughs> I grew up on a small farm in uh, Illinois, central Illinois, and we had 180 acres as I was growing up as a child. And uh, my father had to take a job as a night watchman in order to stay farming. And the, um, then in the, when I turned, um, I was born in 1953, so in the 60s, uh, he um, had to give out, uh, get out of farming because he couldn't keep going to, uh, two jobs at once. And so we uh, moved into town. And um, <clears throat> other than one summer that I took off from uh, my summer work, I usually worked in a factory during the summer. And one summer I decided I was just going to garden all summer, which was um, very upsetting to my father. But um, I spent the summer gardening, and um, from that experience is uh, what kind of fuels what I'm doing now. And in, in a way, what I'm doing now is going back to my roots without going back to farming, per se, and, and you'll see that as we go along. Uh, for me, I'm a teacher. I teach fourth grade. Um, and so uh, my whole life has been about futures, preparing others for futures. And so I always am thinking ahead in, in, in terms of planning ahead. And one of the things that struck me was when I was working with my students, and I'm from DeKalb, Illinois, which is 60 miles west of Chicago. It's a university town. Northern Illinois University is located there. We have a population around 40,000. We're connected to another town, which is Sycamore, Illinois, which has a population around 17,000 and the entire county is 100,000 people. We're right on the edge of the collar counties around Chicago, so we have a lot of rural area around us, and it's all large agricultural farms. We're the largest hog producer in the state of Illinois, our county is, yet you can drive around the county all day and never see a hog. And so uh, when I grew up, as I said, it was on 180 acres. We had cattle, we had hogs, we rotated them, we grass fed them, all that. And so, you know, it was a very different world that these students were growing up in that I was working with. And so um, one of the things I wanted to introduce them to was the idea of where their food comes from because they had a total disconnect from that. Um, <clears throat> so um, our project is to use school and community gardens to teach responsibility, leadership skills, business planning, marketing, sustainable agricultural methods and social service learning. Uh, students will learn from CSA farmers, that's what our SARE grant's being used for, is to pay for uh, a, a young man that's worked three years on um, CSA farms to work with the students and educate them about what organic farming is, what sustainable farming is. And the participants will learn about health benefits and eating fresh, wholesome produce. Now, in our county, as I mentioned, well, where we're located, we have a, about 14% um, of our residents, around 15,000 of them in our county, that are considered food insecure. When you think about that, in a county that's predominantly agricultural, it's uh, quite a 
quite a comment to make. In terms of uh, food deserts, you maybe have heard that term, where people don't have access easily to fresh, wholesome food. Um, we have that situation right in the rural areas as well. 51% of our students are considered low income and qualify for free and reduced lunch. Some of our schools even have 65% of the students qualifying for free and reduced lunch. And when that, what that translates into is if you don't know where your next meal is coming from and you have two or three dollars for your entire family for a day for food, and you rely on food pantries, most of that food's all gonna be prepared, canned, boxed, so on, and so you don't get a chance to have fresh, wholesome vegetables. One of the stories that um, I, has always moved me emotionally about this project is that um, I'm, a, on the, I'm the chair of the board of our local homeless shelter, and one uh, a homeless woman said to me, you mean after all this time, after all these days of going hungry, you mean to tell me that food grows out of the ground? You know, it's just like in the kids that I work with, the same thing. They didn't have an idea even where tomatoes came from. Or when, <laughs> once I remember pulling a carrot out of the ground, and this little girl's eyes got really big. I thought she was going to faint. <laughs> um, so in, in 2006, I was uh, working at the middle school at that time with seventh and eighth grade students who had kicked out of class because they weren't paying attention. So they were put in what's called in-school suspension, which was in a room upstairs that used to be a locker room. They had put some study carols into it, and there was no windows, no fresh air, and we were in there for the rest of the day with them having nothing to do. So um, a lot of them also were um, their family members or uh, relatives were involved with uh, gangs and they had that kind of future ahead of them. So I decided to get some grants and um, I got a grant from our local community development foundation, also from Teaching Tolerance, which is with the Southern Law Poverty Center and some other support. And we put in some gardens behind the um, middle school with those students, and these are the gardens today. They're 10 by 10, three 10 by 10 raised beds. And since that time, uh, we've been keeping this going with students and volunteers, and it's probably produced um, well over a ton of food in itself, just that one garden. Then I moved to fourth grade, as I mentioned before, and I put in a, a small classroom garden with my students in fourth grade. And then the next year, another teacher wanted to get involved, and so we decided to expand it and to take in a larger area so that each classroom in our building could have their own five by 10 raised bed lot. So we took up the sod because uh, our, this building was built in the year 2000. This is all cornfields at one time. And as you know, when they develop, develop, they tell them in, take off all the great topsoil, pack down all the soil. And so we, we went through the work of taking up the sod I now have learned other ways of doing it, so I don't do that anymore, but uh, very often. Um, and then we had a parent volunteer who had construction skills. They built the raised beds for us. Again, we had grant money and support for that from the DeKalb Education Foundation and others. Um, I started an after-school program called the Green Club. It's his uh, fourth and fifth grade students. Um, and so they helped prepare the ground and get it ready for filling the boxes. We had uh, dirt brought in by the school district. And then we had a planting day when we had um, all the classes come out at different times during a two-day period to plant their garden beds. And we had uh, volunteers come in from the Master Gardener Program, University of Illinois Extension Master Gardener Program, as well as other volunteers. At one time, um, this, at this particular moment, I don't know many, how many classes are out there, but at one point we had almost 100 students out there at one time, each working in their own individual beds. Um, one of the things, of course, this whole experience teaches kids is cooperation. And this is an example. I, we had this huge pile of wood chips. We put wood chips around all the raised beds. And the kids on their own came up with this idea of making a a driveway through the middle of the pile so that they could fill the wheelbarrow going down the middle. <laughs> and they covered up, they surrounded all the raised beds as well as did some landscaping around the building. So anyway, this is how the garden ended up then. And that's the way it looks pretty much today. We have 11 raised beds there plus a center area. Um, and each classroom, as I said, has their own bed. 
so our, as I mentioned, our project is pretty small, um, but um, I mean young. We just got started this year, and um, we raised about a, a ton and a half of food this year, you know, and it was all donated for, to food pantries other than what the kids took home themselves. And that wasn't just from that garden. This is from our other projects that we have. We have 16 garden sites that we put in this year. Um, well, two of them we had existing, so 14 went in this year. Uh, seven schools, nine community sites, over 100 beds. All of them are about five by 10 in size. We got 5,000 square feet of garden space. And um, right now we're working with another small, smaller town that's near DeKalb, about a mile away. And they have four acres of vacant land that they're gonna give us. And so that's uh, where we're gonna start putting in some hoop houses and, um, and do some more growing of vegetables there. Um, one of our community locations is in that small town where we um, put in um, raised beds where people could pay a certain amount of rent each year, or each growing season for use of those beds. And so they want to expand that and also we'll have a lot of space now to grow more food for the community. Um, we, one of the things I, I was trying to think, what could I give to you in terms of practicality that you could take back to your own areas? And one of the things I would say is it's really important to just put your idea out there because uh, what I've been um, affected by a lot is how many people come forward and want to get involved. Um, as Levi mentioned, that there's a lot going on right now with this issue of sustainable agric agricultural local food systems, that whole thing. And so there's a lot of... Uh, we were approached by the DeKalb Public Library, and so now we're going to take over one of the vacant lots that they own, and we're going to turn that into a garden space, as well as a learning area for the kids during the summer. Um, our local community college, that's another partnership that you could form no matter where you're located, is um, they, they've also approached us, and then we're, we're working out a partnership with them to have hoop houses, uh, greenhouses there at the community college, as well as have some interns available to us to use and to work with. Um, Northern Illinois University, as I mentioned, is in our town. They have environmental studies department. Again, we're gonna have some interns from there working with us, as well as there's a lot of environmental student groups on these campuses usually that wanna get involved and volunteer and things like that, and also a preschool that we're gonna have a garden at next, next year. One of the important partnerships that we have is with our local hospital and our local YMCA. There's a program called Pioneering Healthy Communities, and that program is a federal grant, which is um, in the area of around 100 and some thousand dollars altogether that they brought in with this federal grant. And um, part of their initiative is walkable community and rideable community, more bike paths, more walking paths, things like that. But the other initiative is community gardens. So ours, our, project started first and then they heard about what we were doing they approached us and asked if we could partner with them and so now we're working together with them and that's how we got our 501c3 status is through the YMCA instead of establishing our own we went under their umbrella for the for that status and so then we we get um, grant money from them as well So again, uh, this is how we would do it. We would go to an area. Now this is where we didn't take up the sod. We would go to an area, lay out where the garden beds are gonna go, and then we put down cardboard in the bottom and then fill them up with compost and soil. We have a local farmer who has spent about uh, half a million dollars on um, developing composting operation on his farm. He uses his corn stalks, he uses leaves from surrounding communities, as well as horse manure he has a whole big operation where he makes these great big long wind rows of compost. He's been very generous with us in terms of working together and making that compost available to us. And that's the way the garden looked during the summer. Didn't turn out very well, that picture. But um, they, they produced on a regular basis over about over 100 pounds of uh, produce every week for food pantries. <clears throat> then we uh, also were, were approached by the city um, to turn in a vacant lot. This is our city hall in the background there. And so we turned in a, va a vacant lot there into what we call the mayor's community garden. And um, again, we had to bring in all the supplies. We have to run the water hose all the way across from there, about 400 feet of water hose from that building to our site. 
So those are some of the obstacles that you ran up against. Um, this is another elementary school. Uh, one, of the th one of the great experiences about all this was um, all of the different volunteers that would get involved, all of different ages and uh, backgrounds. This is our local uh, Hispanic community center uh, where we put in uh, gardens there. And this is a, um, another s really small village that's near DeKalb called Malta. And there we have um, a large elementary school there, and we put in uh, gardens, the raised beds there also. Some of the benefits of school gardens are that uh, in addition to being connected again with the land and, and learning about where your vegetables from, come from and what food really means, is that they gain self-confidence along with leadership skills. They're, they learned, like I give the example of the wood uh, chip pile, just little things like that that you don't think about. Uh, one of the things Levi said is about kids not wanting to touch the dirt. That's one advantage of working at the elementary level is they're not <laughs> they still love playing in the dirt. And to them, it's a lot of fun. And so we had a lot of energy around that. And, and, and they also learn how to um, take responsibility for different different parts of the project. Um, the other thing is that um, there's been a lot of studies done. Uh, right now, um, there's a lot of issues in education about data and keeping your uh, um, uh, annual yearly progress. You probably have heard about that with local school districts here, where you have to have a certain number of uh, test scores above a certain percentage of all your students in order for them to um, reach their goal for that year. And eventually, there was, they were changing it now, but that was going to cut down on their funding from the federal government and from the state governments if they didn't make that annual yearly progress. So when you bring up a project like gardening with schools, um, quite often they wouldn't be open to the idea because they felt it was taking them away from the academics of it. But what we have found with uh, doing a lot of research in the studies, studies show that their achievement scores actually go up when they're involved with projects like this, these types of hands-on projects, and, um, and it makes learning more relevant to them in general. Um, the students become more fit and healthy. They spend more time outdoors. That was another uh, big issue. One of my students uh, last year said to me, I said to him, it was, uh, I think it's Thanksgiving uh, break, they run about four or five days off. I said, what are you going to do over break? Oh, I can't wait for break. He said, I'm going to be playing video games 24-7, you know, indoors, not outdoors. And so it's the, the, the idea that uh, I spent all my childhood outdoors, and it's like just felt sad that these kids were missing that experience. And this is one way of getting them back into that, that kind of experience. They also learn about the food and the healthy food compared to unhealthy food. Uh, they also learn about giving back to the community. As I said, all the excess that the students don't take home with them goes to food pantries, goes to one of our feeding sites. It's called Feed em Soup in our community. And so it helps others as well. Then there's all these benefits that go along with the community gardens. Um, Again, it encourages uh, self-reliance on the people in the, in the neighborhoods. What we do is these uh, schools are spread out throughout our community, and we also have them in the neighboring community of Sycamore. And so um, the neighbors in the areas around the schools and around the uh, community sites can get involved with growing their own food or just getting involved volunteering to make the food available to others who need it. Um, it brings people together. Um, beautifies the neighborhood. There's also been studies to show that it actually, in these neighborhoods where they have community gardens, crime rate actually goes down. None of our gardens have fences around them, and we've had very little in the way of anybody coming in to take the food or anything with, with related to theft. Um, of course, right now with the situation with the economy, being able to reduce your food budget um, to be able to stretch your dollars and food is very important to a lot of people in these, in these neighborhoods. And it preserves green space as well as providing opportunities for intergenerational cross-cultural connections. Um, one of the things that we have is a lot of senior citizens who get involved wanting to work with the kids. That's a great experience because a lot of these kids don't have um, a lot of um, role models in their own families and so it helps them in that way too. 
So again, it's about building relationships is really important. Um, these are just some of the funders that we've had, in our, and all of these are local funders. Um, you can go for national grants, and SARE is the only national grant that we've ever um, um, been able to get because it's very difficult to get national grants or even regional grants. And then in a way, SARE is a regional grant for us. And so, um, you know, what I would encourage you to do if you have any desire to do anything like this is to reach out to the area around you. We've had banks be supportive of us with small grants. Um, we've had um, the school district, of course, the hospital, the YMCA, Kiwanis, civic clubs, they, they all would like to get involved with these sorts of things and help. And one of the interesting things at the top of the list is the Doug and Lynn Roberts Foundation. You may have heard of DeKalb Seacorn. I'm sure you probably have. Anybody here heard of DeKalb Seacorn? Okay. That started out with this one small farming family called the Roberts family, and they developed the Seacorn over time. And then about oh, 10 or 15 years ago now, I guess, they sold the business to Pfizer first, and then Pfizer sold it to Monsanto. And now it's the largest uh, Seacorn uh, available in the world. And um, so anyway, they have been very supportive of this project as well. Again, I think because they started out as small farmers themselves, they identify with the idea of access to food, they identify with the idea of how farming has changed, and um, have been very supportive of it. So um, our goals for the future, my timekeeper isn't here, I guess I'm doing okay. Um, the goals for the future are to reconnect children to the land and nature, as I mentioned before, provide children the opportunity to learn about the origin of their food, um, work toward a food secure community. One of the things we're gonna be doing this winter is creating a uh, local food security council. I'm gonna get all the food pantries together, get some of the uh, uh, faith-based organizations together, and other nonprofits in our county, get us all together in one place. Because right now our food pantries are all open at different times. They're located in churches and Salvation Army, all different locations. So people who don't have a lot of money, who don't have a car, who have to try to work part-time jobs and so on, it's difficult for them to get to the food pantries. So we're gonna see what we can do to try to figure out a better way to do this so that they have easy access. On a Thursday afternoon is the last time the food pantries open. And then after that, um, they don't have, and if it's a holiday where there's uh, nothing open on, on Mondays, then they have four days sometimes to go without being having access to the food. And so one of the things we want to try to do is work at closing the food gap in our county. Um, some additional goals is um, one of the things I want to highlight is that we're going to be creating a sustainable farm and community sustainability learning center uh, based at our high school. We have a new high school that was just built two years ago. And um, it has 30 acres of land around the high school, farmland. And we're hoping to take that land and turn it into an actual working farm with um, uh, using sustainable agricultural methods and uh, create a CSA for the parents of the, of the kids at the school so that they can um, have the produce from the farm. Any excess would go to the uh, local food feeding sites. Um, our also, one of our main goals is create a sustainable revenue stream. One of the things we teach the kids is about composting, and all of our sites eventually will have compost piles so that we can start, and especially that four-acre site, we hope to be able to do a large amount of composting and start bringing in some revenue in terms of collecting food scraps from local restaurants and local residents because we don't have municipal food scrap composting in our area. And so... Um, we hope to be able to do that as a way of charge a little bit to pick up those food scraps from those individuals and those businesses and be able to use that as a revenue screen. We're also going to be establishing a, a community commercial kitchen for processing the food so that um, people, uh, farmers or local growers of one kind or another can rent the space, go in there and do their own processing and make it available to the community um, for sale and they would pay a little bit of rent for that and that would be another possible small revenue st stream. Um, Levi already talked quite a bit about a community food system, and that, as I mentioned, that's one of the things we're working on in our county. One of the things you might want to bring up, too, with uh, as you go for, uh, I don't know what it's like in Missouri, but in Illinois, we have $46 billion a year uh, spent on food, 
and 85% of the fruits and vegetables consumed in Illinois could be grown in Illinois, but that money is going out of Illinois. We only have about um, 20 or less than 20, about 2% of the money stays in the state for food. And even though we're an agricultural state, it goes out of the, out, as you know, your food usually travels 1,500 miles before it gets to your plate. Um, so here are some resources if you're interested in doing this on your own. Um, is the American Community Garden Association. Uh, University, of Al uh, University of Missouri has a uh, community gardening toolkit on their uh, website. And the University of Illinois Extension Master Gardener Program, which is not relevant for you, but you have one here in Missouri, too. Um, so one of the things I wanted to leave with you was that the important thing is, if you're interested in doing something like this, is always to be thinking in terms of what relationships you can build and who you can tap into and reach out to in your own community and to use all forms of communication. We have a Facebook page with over 200 members on it. We have our website. We, um, we have brochures. Uh, there's all kinds of ways, to, and we knock on people's doors. We go door to door in the neighborhoods around the gardens to reach out to people and get them involved. And um, one last thing, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you are a farmer and you're struggling to get by, and um, you have all the headaches and you have all the struggles of a nonprofit without any of the perks, if, the, if you consider grants a perk. Most farmers are, are burdened with loans. Um, what we get is grants. If you work in an educational component into what you're doing on your farms, you are, then can move into having a separate 501c3 nonprofit as part of your business. Thank you. I'm your timekeeper. Oh, okay. You did fine, Dan, and thank you very much. Is there a quick question or two you'd like to ask? There's one back there. This is uh, one of the best programs I've ever seen, especially if just one year you've been doing this. It must be more than just you. How did, did you use the American Community Garden Association, and how many people actually kind of got this thing rolling? Uh, that's a good question. Well, we started in uh, March of this year, or February was our first meeting. Basically, um, I used a, a network of friends I already had, but I got the word out through the newspaper article, and uh, we had our first meeting, and it just kind of grew from there. We have about 25 people that make up a core committee that is like a steering committee for it. And then from there, we have, as I mentioned, we've had over the year probably 200 or more volunteers from Boy Scouts, uh, class, the schools themselves have the kids involved with, with planting the gardens and caring for the gardens and harvesting the gardens. If it's a community site like the uh, Hispanic Center, they have some of their own um, volunteers from the Hispanic Center to take care of the gardens. So it's a lot of volunteers, right? So and it's, I, mean, I don't get paid anything. I, I consider myself the director, but I don't get paid anything. It's all volunteer um, work. Uh, Dan says he'll be out back for a little bit, and uh, so you can ask him questions back there if you want to. Thank you again, Dan. That was really a good program.